My first chef's secret for Christmas is be organized and get prepared. In restaurant kitchens, we call this mise en place, getting vegetables chopped, stocks made, and sauces ready. It's the religion by which all good chefs live. I don't want to spend Christmas in the kitchen ignoring my family and friends when we're all finally together. So I'm prepared with dishes that I can cook in advance that will last over Christmas. Adding a glazed ham to your holiday menu is a great way to get ahead. It's delicious, versatile, and the ultimate dish to have in the fridge for any hungry guests who drop by. Christmas would never be the same without a beautiful, delicious, honey-glazed ham. Across that long Christmas period, this can get you out of jail quite easily. Ham salads, ham sandwiches, ham, egg and chips. This is a gammon. What we're going to do now is cook it so it becomes a ham. Into a pan. First things first, the water. Cover it completely so the whole gammon cooks evenly. The important part now is adding flavour in there. Carrots in. The leeks. The more veg in there now, the more fragrant the broth becomes. Once the ham is cooked, that stock is extraordinary. The base to a fantastic soup. Onion, not finely chopped, and in. Homemade ham stock is packed with flavour, so it's great for making soups, sauces, stews and risottos. Plus it can be frozen, so it's there when you need it. Pan down. Peppercorns, lightly crush. Then, to give it a Christmas flavour, I'm adding crushed coriander seeds, two cinnamon sticks and four aromatic bay leaves. Up to the boil, and then turn it down, let it simmer, and then skim it. Cooking a ham isn't hard, but it does take time. This two kilo joint takes two and a half hours to simmer before it's glazed and baked. However, it is worth it because it tastes absolutely delicious. So, the glaze, very, very simple. Demerara sugar, Madeira. That sweetens the glaze, basically a fortified wine. A couple of tablespoons, in, and then Share vinegar. Again, a couple of tablespoons. Honey in. Nice. Bring that up to the boil. The longer you leave it on the stove, the darker it becomes. You want your ham really nice and dark, then cook out the glaze for three or four minutes. That, I'm happy with. Lovely. Right. The gammon's cooked now. Onto the plate. Carefully snip the string. Nice and gently peel back. Get rid of the skin, then crisscross it. Don't push too deep. Let the knife do the work. Stud it with some cloves. Look at it. Almost looks like an albino pineapple. The glaze and just carefully cover. Start in the middle and let it work round. Oh, God. Gently, 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 gently. It's not even roasted yet and it looks amazing. Beautiful. Look at that. Half the glaze over now into the oven. 15 minutes. It's starting to colour. Get the rest of the glaze and pour that over. Look at it, wow. The more effort, passion and love you show the ham now, the results are tenfold. Look at it. Every five minutes, out of the oven and glaze again. And back into the oven now, at 190 degrees, and we're gonna baste and roast for 35 minutes. Delicious. Next, I'm going to make a pear and saffron chutney. This is a fruity relish that works brilliantly with a sweet aromatic ham. First things first, slice the onion. Fry the chopped onion in olive oil without colouring it. The important part about this stage is the fact that we're going to layer the chutney with textures, from onion to apple to pear, and a nice little block of ginger, grating the ginger so the ginger sort of disappears with the onions. 
then add the spices. A good grating of nutmeg, followed by a teaspoon of cinnamon and a teaspoon of cayenne pepper to give it a kick. Delicious. I recently spent a lot of time in India, where chutneys originated, and discovered that whereas British-style chutneys tend to be cooked and are usually quite sweet, Indian ones are normally fresh, spicier, and quite sour. Next, demerara sugar. Once that sugar's dissolved, the white wine vinegar, all in. That's gonna give it this really nice sort of sweet and sour flavor. From there, our fruit. These are Williams pears. Pear is the star of the chutney, so keep it quite rustic. Next, add chopped cooking apples. Their tartness gives a lovely contrast to the sweetness of the pears. To give it great texture, a handful of sultanas. A pinch of saffron. This gives it a really nice depth, a rich golden color. Saffron is the world's most expensive spice. It's made from the dried stigmas of the saffron crocus flower. And as a general rule of thumb, the deeper the color of the threads, the better the quality. And to make it lighter, the zest and juice of two oranges. The orange and the saffron go brilliantly well together. Just squeeze that in there. This chutney is brilliant with ham, fantastic in salads, but equally as delicious with fish. Whether it's a roasted cod, a grilled fillet of mackerel, it goes brilliantly well. Bring that up to the boil. Cook that out for 15 minutes. Now, tomatoes going at the end. And that brings a certain amount of freshness to the chutney. Really helps to give it that nice texture. Mix that in. And literally cook it out for 30 seconds. What's great about this chutney is that as it matures, its flavor gets better and better. And it will keep for up to six months. Fill up the jar. And that is going to deliver amazing flavor across Christmas. And look, my goodness me, that is fit for a king. Next, on my ultimate Christmas menu, the secret of making my delicious pumpkin soup extra silky and smooth. And this is a bit of a naughty chef's trick. A little knob of butter in there. So when it blends, it gets really nice and smooth. Tips on how I get my beef wellington gloriously succulent. The secret of overlapping the parma ham is to make sure it contains all those juices coming out of the beef. And my recipe for mulled wine with a difference. Lemongrass. So this makes it slightly Asian here, a little bit more sort of exciting, but gives a really nice light twist to the wine. My next chef's secret is don't waste food. Christmas is a really expensive time, but with a little understanding and finesse, you can use up every edible part of your Christmas shopping, just like we do in my restaurant kitchens. Otherwise, it's money down the drain. Soups are one of the secrets in a chef's arsenal for delivering amazing flavor whilst watching the pennies. My next recipe for sumptuous pumpkin soup uses the whole pumpkin, the leftover ham stock, and I'm getting the kids involved, toasting the pumpkin seeds as a snack. Nothing goes to waste in my kitchen. But most importantly of all, the soup tastes absolutely delicious. And with the addition of sauteed wild mushrooms, it's fit to serve in my three mission star restaurant. Right, listen, I need some help. Okay, we're gonna make the most amazing pumpkin soup. Feel? That's heavy. It's very heavy. But it is gonna be absolutely delicious, right? Now, you can always tell, okay, if it's ripe. It would bang on there. What does that sound like? Um, drums. Drums, that's right. And if you push your thumb in there, it should be just a little bit soft, right at the bottom of the root. Yeah. Right, first of all, we to cut it in half and very carefully just cut through. I'm using a French pumpkin, but these versatile vegetables come in all shapes and sizes and colors. At this time of year, their nutty sweetness is ideal for warming soups, curries, and roasts. Wait and see what happens when we open this up. Wow. Oh, oh. Right, 
Holly, that's for you. Now, this is where it's going to get a little bit gory, OK? You get your hands and you scrape the seeds out. <laughs> Put I like them the getting messy. Rub them together and just give them a little clean. Nice and gently. Good. Yeah? Nice. Look at that. Yuck. What do you mean, yuck? Come on, Holly. That's it. Into the water. Now, once the seeds are out, we're going to toast them in the oven as a little snack. So this is a really nice way of not wasting anything. Get your fingers right in there, Tilly. There you go. Boo. <laughs> once the pumpkin seeds are out, score the flesh to help it roast and absorb flavour. Season and add a generous amount of rosemary. Take the garlic, rub around the outside so it perfumes the inside. Then add a large glug of olive oil. And as the garlic roasts with the rosemary, its sweet, almost buttery, nutty taste will mellow and flavour the pumpkin. All the seeds done? Yeah, almost. Good. After the pumpkin seeds have been cleaned, dry and season them, ready for the oven. Now they're going to roast in the oven for about 45 to 50 minutes. Well done. Good. And wait and smell the house in about five minutes' time. Tray, please, Holly. So, beautiful. Straight in. Right, well done. Uh, big question. Have you wrapped Mummy's present yet? No. Let's go. I'll give you a hand, quickly. God, that garlic smells amazing. Holly! Tilly! Where's Holly? She's going to a party. She's going to a party? Oh, no. Um, any boys there? Um, I don't know. Oh, you're so diplomatic. Right. Look. They are now toasted. Hear that? Right, have a little taste of one of those. Nice? Yeah. But look at this. Wow. wow. That looks amazing. And that is your roasted pumpkin. <laughs> now, you put the spoon down the side. OK? Yep. You're scooping out all that lovely... Pumpkin. ..roast pumpkin. We don't waste anything. Hear that skin? All into the centre. Roasting a pumpkin intensifies the rich, sweet flavour of its flesh, which is lovely for soups, but also great as a filling for ravioli or making a delicious mash with butter, nutmeg and salt and pepper. That's the pumpkin done. Now, what I want you to do is get these mushrooms here and just peel them lengthways, OK, onto the plate. OK, and I'll get my onion chopped. Olive oil in. OK? Yeah. Nice and generous with the olive oil, because we want this soup to be really nice and velvety. Onions in. Mmm. And then scoop out that wonderful garlic that's been roasted on the pumpkin. Mmm. Mm. Lovely. A little bit of nutmeg on top of the onions. Onions, garlic, nutmeg, yeah? And now, the pumpkin. Mmm. Wow. See that? Yeah. I knew it would come in handy somewhere. This little baby is for you. There you go. Perfect. Now, I want you just to grate some parmesan like that for me. OK? Just so I can start roasting off the parmesan as well, so we get this really nice, rich, delicious the pumpkin. Parmesan's brilliant for enriching this soup. Its mellow caramel flavour and saltiness provide a lovely balance to the sweet pumpkin. Now what I want you to do, let's tip all that in there, OK? Yeah, good. Look at that now. That, huh? Mmm, smell that. Roasted, sort of cheesy, rosemary, garlicky, yeah, olive oily, beautiful. So far, nothing's gone to waste. We've used the whole pumpkin. Now I'm going to add the stock my ham was cooked in. It smells of cinnamon. It does smell of cinnamon, doesn't it? It smells Christmassy. Delicious. Very Christmassy. That's just from cooking our ham. Bring that up to the boil, and we'll let that cook out for 10 minutes. Cream, really important that it's boiling when the cream goes in. OK, you'll see the colour lightening. So that's going to give it a really nice, rich, creamy taste. OK, now we're going to soak the mushrooms. A little bit of olive oil in there, yeah? Get nice and hot. We'll go first with the trompe de la mort. In you go. Good girl. Then the pied de mouton, in. 
And then finally, chanterelle. Nice, lovely. I want you to put a little bit of butter in there. Off we go. Good girl. A little bit of butter there. Nice. I love the deep, complex flavour of wild mushrooms. But if you can't get them, chestnut or filled mushrooms still deliver great taste. Mushrooms work really well with pumpkin because they have a warm, earthy flavour that complements the pumpkin beautifully. So, mushrooms into the centre. Yeah? Yeah. From there, we get the parmesan and just peel nice, long layers. Watch very carefully. No, just sit that on top. Oh, the parmesan helps to season the mushroom and really give off an amazing flavour. OK. Mm -hmm. We're going to blend the soup. Mm -hmm. And all we're going to do is half fill the blender so the soup gets really nicely aerated. Now, this is a bit of a naughty chef's trick. A little knob of butter in there, just in top. So when it blends, it gets really nice and smooth. Lid on, onto the blender, and we'll just pulse it on and off first. Nice. Wow. And this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Just one side of the bowl. So that's Daddy's portion. That. This little bit is yours. Mmm. Now, a little taste. Blow it gently. Mmm. Yum. <laughs> well done. things fresh and interesting, chefs have to be open to new ideas. So we're always looking to innovate or update old recipes. My next chef's secret for the ultimate Christmas is give your classic Christmas recipes a nice revamp. Because I work long and unsociable hours throughout the year, I really look forward to catching up with friends and family during the Christmas holidays. It's a time to be sociable, parties, drinks, guests dropping by. And having a warming jug of aromatic mulled wine and some spiced nuts on hand really puts everyone in the Christmas spirit. Love that sound. Christmas is here. Mulled wine is a real Christmas classic, but I'm going to give it a modern 21st century twist. First, pour red wine into a pan and gently heat. Now, I'm going to make a fragrant bouquet garni. Basically, a really nice aromatic tea bag. Muslin cloth, absolutely perfect for this. If you haven't got muslin cloth, a brand new J cloth is just as good. Now, first off, cardamom pods. They are incredibly aromatic, and more importantly, gives it a really nice, dense, spicy flavor. Next, add a pinch of cloves. Cloves are dried flower buds, and they add a lovely, pungent, sweet flavor. Then drop in a couple of star anise, which adds an aniseed note. A cinnamon stick. Cinnamon sticks are made from the bark of trees native to Sri Lanka. Break one in, and this gives a warm, sweet spice to the wine. Lemongrass. So this makes it slightly asian a little bit more sort of exciting, but gives a really nice light twist to the wine. And all I'm going to do first is just press down on the lemongrass. And what that does, it starts to release all that oil and flavour. Once it's crushed, just cut it over the muslin cloth. Once all your spices are in, fold up the muslin cloth and tie tightly. And look, that is like a little miniature perfect chef's pillow into the wine. Next, add orange zest. Twist, then cut the orange into wedges and pop those in too. To sweeten the wine, put in a tablespoon of demerara sugar. Next, stem ginger. Gives the mulled wine a little bit of a sort of kick. Almost like that really nice sort of ginger beer aftertaste at the back of your throat. Finally, a couple of tablespoons of the ginger syrup. And then simply heat the wine gently for four to five minutes to infuse all the fantastic flavors. But don't let it boil or the alcohol will evaporate. And to go with that, the most amazing spice nuts. I love nuts. So I'm using Brazils, almonds, 
walnuts and hazelnuts. And then finally, pistachios. Lovely. A really nice festive mix. As the nuts toast, they start to release their natural oils. Then add a couple of pinches of salt. And then just let them lightly toast. Once the nuts start to colour, add half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, which is made from ground chilies. Then sprinkle in half a teaspoon of paprika, a milder spice made from dried pimentos for sweetness and depth. And now you can see the nuts absorbing all that wonderful flavour. Absolutely delicious. Finally, put in a sprig of rosemary. Give the pan a good toss to make sure all the nuts are thoroughly coated and they're done. Ultimate Christmas menu, tips on how I get my sublime salmon niçoise not only tasting great, but looking great too. The secret dressing is starting from the centre and working your way out. I want something that looks visually stunning. And the trick to finishing off the perfect Christmas panna cotta. Almost like chocolate gold leaf and sprinkle it on top. Another chef's secret for the ultimate Christmas is keep your menu balanced. In the restaurant, we work incredibly hard to get the perfect balance of flavours, textures and richness in every meal. And the same is true for getting it right at home. So, over Christmas, when you indulge in a lot of rich food, it's crucial you have some light dishes up your sleeve to really balance it out. Salads are the perfect antidote to overextended bellies at Christmas. But they don't have to be virtuous affairs. You can save that one for your New Year's resolution. I'm going to show you my secret for turning salad niçoise into a dish dramatic and delicious enough to merit a place in any Christmas celebration. Sam is a real big hit in our household over Christmas. It's delicious, so versatile, and tastes absolutely amazing. Now, we're going to do a delicious salmon niçoise, which is a really nice way of reinvigorating your taste buds across Christmas. First of all, we're going to poach this in a really nice, fragrant court bouillon. Court bouillon is just a fancy name for poaching liquor. First, add fennel with its lovely aniseed flavour to water. Then put in chopped celery, onions and salt. Next, pour in some white wine to give it some body. Add a splash of tarragon vinegar to give it bite. That wakes up everything. That really makes it sort of slightly acidic, but more importantly, it goes brilliantly well with the salmon. To add flavour, pop in a couple of star anise and crushed white peppercorns. For freshness and zing, put in a handful of parsley, a couple of bay leaves and a sliced lemon. Then bring the liquid up to the boil and slip in the salmon. No need to season it because the water, the court bouillon, is all seasoned beautifully. Slip that in, nice and gently. Skin side down. Salmon's sweet, delicate and incredibly flavoursome. Now it's going to go even higher in terms of flavour. Simmer the salmon for four to five minutes, then turn it off and let it cool down in the liquid. Salmon poached, the next job is making the light tarragon mayonnaise. Tarragon mayonnaise with the difference. First of all, hand make it. Just start off with one egg yolk. A little bit of heat in there, a teaspoon of mustard, a little splash of tarragon vinegar in. Whisk that first. Nice big balloon whisk. And then when the bowl starts moving, get your cloth, open it up, just go round and keep that on there. That's not going anywhere now. Yeah. What we've got to do first is whisk nice and thick so it can take the oil. Whisk with one hand, sunflower oil in the other. Thumb over the end of the bottle, tip it upside down, Slowly drip it, feed the oil in. Whisk, whisk, whisk. Drip, drip, drip. And stop. Whisk and change hands. That way, nothing's getting tired. Whisk, whisk, whisk. Drizzle the sunflower oil in. Stop. Once you've got that nice base, you can add the oil quicker. It's so easy. Delicious. When it's reached a luscious, thick consistency, 
add a squeeze of lemon juice and that's your basic mayonnaise done. But I'm gonna thin it down with water because I want it much, much lighter, almost like a vinaigrette, which is perfect for the salmon niçoise. Still nice and creamy. Now add chopped tarragon. The aniseed taste works really well with the eggs and lemon zest to liven it up. And now the seasoning, always at the end. Salt, pepper, and just mix that round. Look, beautiful. It's got the texture of a custard, almost like a lemon curd. It's incredibly rich, and it just falls off the spoon. It's traditional to use boiled eggs in salad niçoise, but I'm gonna do mine differently. I'm gonna coddle the eggs. First put some water onto heat, then coat espresso cups or similar oven-proof containers with butter. Next, season each cup with pepper and lime with a couple of basil leaves, which gives the eggs a lovely herby note. We're gonna season it with a classic niçoise garnish, anchovies. Just roll that round like a little ring and sit that at the bottom of the basil. Then crack in your eggs. Every little component going on that plate makes a big difference. Taking it up to that little extra special level. Place the espresso cups in a bath of boiling water and bake in the oven for about eight minutes so the yolks are still soft and creamy. With the eggs in the oven, it's time to bring the final components of the niçoise together. To add color and freshness to the salad, marinade cherry tomatoes in olive oil with shredded basil and lemon zest. The lemon goes brilliantly with the salmon. The salmon's fragrant, but just take those tomatoes even further. Because this is a salad for winter, I want some of my ingredients to be hot. After parboiling potatoes and green beans, I soaked them together. And just give them a little toss. When you think of salad niçoise, you think of a beautiful summer salad. The exciting way of doing it now at Christmas is having a really nice hot niçoise. When all the ingredients are prepared, it's time to bring the dish together and dress the serving plate. The secret dressing is starting from the center and working your way out. First of all, crispy salad leaves just in the center of your plate. What we're doing now is building a base. I don't want a flat salad. I want a salad with energy, excitement, and more importantly, I want something that looks visually stunning. Slice the baby gem lettuce hearts into wedges and lightly roll them in the tarragon mayonnaise. And this is really important because in 10 minutes time, this salad will still stay nice and crisp, buoyant, exciting, and more importantly, packed full of flavor. Next, our sauté potatoes around the outside. I want the color now, I want the visual the impact. Then I'm gonna sort of interlink the green beans. Next, add the marinated tomatoes and some black olives. Now for the exciting part, removing the eggs from the espresso cup. That little basil leaf is the crucial secret because that's like a little blanket that slides it out, fingers crossed. Out, bang. And I want that yolk still nice and creamy inside. The saltiness from the anchovy. It's almost pureed at the bottom of that egg and that nice, fragrant, sweet basil. Almost like they've been rolled in perfume. Delicious. And finally, the salmon. And just peel off that skin. Wow, the silver slipper. Carefully flake the salmon and then drape it on the salad. And lay this amazing salmon over. You see the pinkness, incredibly aromatic. And more importantly, every slither of that salmon it tastes amazing. And that is a perfect salmon niçoise for Christmas. Along with flavour, aroma and presentation, one of the key elements in lifting a dish from the ordinary to the extraordinary is texture. Get the texture right and you take food to that next level of indulgence.
My aim when I'm cooking at home during the Christmas holidays is to make dishes with a minimum fuss that still deliver the wow factor. My next recipe for panna cotta ticks all the right boxes. It's easy to make and has a silky smooth texture that makes it one of the world's sexiest desserts. First, add 250 milliliters of cream to a pan. Then pour in 50 mils of milk and add 50 grams of caster sugar. Get the sugar in early because it stops the milk and cream from boiling over. Give that a little stir. Bring that up to the ball. Panna cotta, which means cooked cream in Italian, can be flavored with anything from vanilla to coffee to chocolate. I'm giving mine a grown-up kick with a splash of rum. In. Once the cream has come to the boil, take it off the heat and add a couple of leaves of gelatine that have been soaked in cold water and squeezed dry. Then whisk them in. And the gelatine sets the cooked cream. So we want that really nice sort of blancmange texture. Rich, silky, and incredibly smooth. Once the gelatine has dissolved, pour the panna cotta straight into serving glasses. Traditionally, it's set in molds, then turned out onto a plate, but I'm keeping mine simple. Leave a little space on top for the glaze. Now, set them into the fridge. Beautiful. Next, the pomegranate glaze. Add some caster sugar to the pan and pour in pomegranate juice. Then simply bring it to the boil and reduce it down to the consistency of a sticky syrup. In Iran, where pomegranates originated, they use this sweet sticky syrup to flavor chicken and game birds. A beautiful, rich, sticky glaze. Pour that into a jar, leave that to cool down. Take the panna cotta from the fridge. They set beautifully. And they're not too firm, just slightly bouncy, a little bit springy on top. Carefully pour the cool pomegranate glaze over. Just roll them around a little bit, just to fill those edges. Finally, take a bar of chocolate that's been chilled in the freezer so it's easier to use and scrape off thin shards. Almost like sort of chocolate gold leaf and sprinkle it on top. The secret of how to make your beef wellington look a million dollars. It's a chefy thing, a little bit of decoration. Back of the knife and then just twist. A fantastic shortbread to fill your biscuit tin with over Christmas. And that's perfect for a cup of tea, mid-afternoon. And tips on how to transform these recipes into stunning new dishes that will see you through the festive period. As a chef, it's always satisfying to take a classic dish, give it a facelift, and bring it bang up to date. My new version of Beef Wellington retains the luxuriousness which made it brilliant in the first place, but gives it a seasonal lift. If you want to really spoil your friends this Christmas, this is the perfect special occasion dish. Beef Wellington has to be the ultimate indulgence. One of my all-time favorite main courses, and it would definitely be on my last supper menu. My version is a lot lighter and sexier, and for Christmas, I'm gonna give it an added twist. First off, the fillet of beef. Now, look at it, it's beautiful. First, the most important part is to sear it. Salt, pepper. The fillet is the leanest and the most expensive cut of beef. It comes from underneath the lower backbone, a part of the animal which has very little muscle, and this is what makes it such a tender cut. Very, very hot pan, olive oil, and literally roll it around the pan. We're not cooking the beef, we're just searing it, which will really help to give another layer of flavor and beef in. Lovely. Now use the side of the pan so the beef sears down the back when you tilt it. It's a secret to get it done quickly. It gives that really nice roasted flavor. Delicious. Once you've got the color, very carefully lift up the beef and sear it on top and sear it on the bottom. Out and onto the plate. English mustard. What this does now, it gives it a bit of sort of, bit of heat. Just lightly brush the mustard. 
over the beef. So really important that you do this as the beef comes straight out of the pan. And as the beef starts to cool down, it absorbs all that heat from the mustard. Horseradish is a really nice alternative as well. Just leave that to sit and relax. As the fillet rests, prepare the filling, which is called a duxelle. Put 700 grams of chestnut mushrooms into a blender, add a chopped clove of garlic, season with salt and pepper, and blitz. Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without chestnuts. I just crumble them in to the mushrooms. The chestnut's sweet, nutty flavor works brilliantly with the earthy taste of the mushrooms. And because they contain more starch and less oil than other nuts, they have a much softer texture that is perfect for the filling. Mm, that smells amazing. It smells like Christmas. Once the mixture is finely chopped, cook in a hot, dry pan. This removes the water from the mushrooms and intensifies the flavor. You can see the water coming out instantly. Such an essential stage, really critical to the success of the Wellington that you dry those mushrooms out and get rid of all that water. Take the mushrooms up even further, some fresh thyme in there, which will make it really nice and light and fragrant. When all the water's been fried off, remove from the pan and leave to cool. Then start assembling the Wellington. Stage one, wrapping the beef fillet. First of all, these wonderful slices of parma ham. And look, beautiful. Overlap it and set it there. So the secret of overlapping the parma ham is to make sure it contains all those juices coming out of the beef. In the traditional recipe for beef wellington, a thick chive and spring onion pancake is used instead of ham. But the parma ham makes the dish much lighter and its sweet, salty flavor really complements the mushroom and chestnut filling. A little touch of pepper, no salt, because the ham is naturally salty. Just a little twist of pepper. And then from there, your mushrooms. And basically, mushrooms go on. Use the back of the spoon to spread them nice and thinly. Half an inch from the ends. Rump holes. No, hop it. Every time there's meat, out he comes. Next, lay the beef on top. And very carefully, fold that over. Now, we're gonna lift that up and wrap the beef nice and carefully. So all that mushroom and parma ham is encasing the beef all the way over. Push it nice and tight, roll it nice and tight, and go all the way over. Now, the secret from here is to really let the clean film do the work. Just nip it at the ends and squeeze. And what we're doing is just creating this wonderful sort of cylinder shape off and then just twist it nice and tightly. And the tighter it is, the more perfect the shape. Then place it in the fridge for 15 minutes to firm up. Once it's set, it's ready for the final wrap. A little bit of tin film, puff pastry. Beef. Now, very carefully, first roll the puff pastry over the beef until the two edges meet. Then trim off any excess pastry and twist the ends together to ensure the beef is completely sealed in its pastry case. To set that perfectly and get it really nice and firm to make it really cylinder type, Clean from over. And just pull that nice and tight. But the big secret behind this is that it can be done the night before. And the tighter the clean film, the better the shape. The more even the shape, the more even it cooks. Put it back in the fridge for five minutes to firm up again. Then take off the clean film. Always like the perfect Christmas cracker. To give the pastry a lovely, rich, golden brown color when it bakes, brush it with egg yolk. And then finally, you don't have to do this, but it's a chef thing, a little bit of decoration. 
back of the knife down and then just twist and mark the pastry. When it comes out of the oven, it's got that wow factor. Add a generous sprinkle of salt to ensure the pastry becomes lovely and crisp. Then bake in an oven at 200 degrees for around 35 minutes, depending on how rare you like your beef. Once out of the oven, it's crucial you let the Wellington rest for at least 10 minutes. This allows the meat to relax and reabsorb its delicious juices, making sure it's tender and succulent. Nice and gently. Hear that pastry, how crisp that is. This is the bit we've been waiting for. Oh, wow. My God. I'm in heaven. And for me, if you want a really nice change to roast turkey, this has to be the ultimate for the table. It smells Christmassy. The chestnuts, the mushrooms, and that nice crisp pastry on the outside. Look at it. I'm ready to die and go to heaven. For a really special occasion, I love to serve my beef wellington with gloriously creamy mashed potatoes and shavings of exquisite white truffle. What's great about my ultimate Christmas recipes is they can be used as a base for a whole range of other wonderful dishes, giving you truly delicious food throughout the Christmas holidays. Poached salmon will keep for three days in the fridge and is a really versatile ingredient to have in the kitchen at Christmas. It makes a wonderful salmon, spinach and goat's cheese quiche or simply served with boiled potatoes and a light mayonnaise. It's a delicious lunch. It's even great for a sophisticated breakfast. Put it on top of poached egg and toasted muffin with a dollop of tarragon mayonnaise and you've got salmon eggs benedict. The glazed ham is another brilliant all-rounder. Great for speedy salads and sandwiches. It's also delicious in a spaghetti carbonara or a wonderful leek ham and mushroom pie. And when you want a simple snack, coddled eggs are delicious on toast, hot or cold. Roasted pumpkin is cheap, adaptable and delicious. It makes glorious tarts, luscious risotto and a really fast and tasty sauce for any pasta. Simply add it to fried pancetta and finish it with nutmeg, chestnuts and sage. When your friends or neighbours pop round for tea at Christmas, it's great if your biscuit tin is well stocked. Having a homemade shortbread on hand is an ideal way to revitalise famished guests. It's delicious on its own or can be quickly dressed up if they demand something fancier. First, slice open a vanilla pod and scrape out the seeds. Now the flavour in those seeds is mind-blowing. Look at it, beautiful. Now, two whole eggs in. Two. Give that a whisk. Next, add 125 grams of unsalted butter to the mixer. Once the butter's soft, add 90 grams of caster sugar and cream them together until they're lovely and smooth. Gradually pour in the beaten eggs and vanilla seeds. Add a pinch of salt and beat thoroughly until the mixture becomes paler. Then put in 250 grams of plain flour and mix until it forms a dough. It should just be nice and firm, slightly soft and not too wet. Perfect. And be careful because you hold it in your hands for too long, it starts to melt. Flour your hands on the board and shape the dough into a circle. And it's got a really nice, soft, sensual, sexy feel. Really nice and creamy. Now roll it out to a thickness of one centimetre. Cut out a large circle, then put it onto a baking tray lined with parchment and decorate. Half again. Just like my grandma used to make. Thumb in and in. Chill the shortbread for an hour to help it set. Then bake it in a medium oven for 20 minutes until it turns a pale golden colour. Just sprinkle a little bit of sugar. Really nice to do when it's just come out so it sort of, it melts into the shortbread. Nice and generous. And that's perfect for a cup of tea, mid-afternoon. As well as filling your biscuit tin over Christmas, 
this shortbread can easily be transformed into a great festive dessert. Using a hot spoon, scoop out lozenges of creme fraiche and sit that on top. Then grate over the zest of a clementine. And finish with clementine halves. The tartness of the creme fraiche works with the sweetness of the clementine. The best way to make cooking easier and less stressful on Christmas Day is to get organised and prepare as much as possible in advance, leaving you more time to spend with your family. Making a stunning pork, apricot and pistachio stuffing the day before is a great way to get ahead. It's easy to do, looks a million dollars and tastes absolutely delicious. Christmas dinner for me is not about food piled high on a plate. Less is more. I'd rather have five or six things on a plate that taste absolutely delicious than 10 items tasting average. Stuffing, for instance. I'd much rather put a lot more effort into the stuffing and enjoy it, but eat a lot less of it. First, add pork mince to the bowl, season with salt and pepper, and mix. Take your grater and a braver and apple. Just get the grater and grate the apple in there. Usually stuffing is cooked in the turkey, but I'm doing mine separately so I can make it in advance and get the flavour and presentation spot on. Now, the nice thing about the apple, it goes brilliantly well with the pork. It makes it a little bit sweeter. It also makes it a lot lighter as well, which is really important. Next, add a handful of chopped apricots, which gives the stuffing another fruity note and a lovely texture. The apple disintegrates, but the apricots stay really nice and intact. Nice little bite. Then chop a handful of pistachio nuts. Again, I'm thinking of the build-up of textures, flavour, and also colour. Pistachio is in. Now, give that a really good mix. Grating some lemon zest. The zest is packed full of intensely flavoured essential oils, which gives the stuffing a vibrant citrus zing. And for freshness, add a handful of coarsely chopped parsley. The balance of flavours is nice and delicate, and it sits beautifully with the turkey. Now, sage and pork and apple, that's the perfect marriage. Now I'm going to think about the presentation skills. Tim Fall. A little drizzle of olive oil. And then we get a really nice fragrant sage leaves. The sage leaves are used to wrap the stuffing. Start by overlapping them. It's almost like rolling a cigar, but we're going to roll it in sage leaves. Taste is paramount, but presentation is really important too. So it's worth spending a few extra minutes to get this right, because it will make the final dish look amazing. Now, a little season across the top. And then take your sausage meat. And what I want to do now is put half of it onto the plate. On your finger along the stuffing. This is where it takes on a completely different flavour again. I need some spice in there. I want a little bit of heat in the stuffing so it's exciting to eat. Mergays. Mergays are traditional North African sausages made from beef or lamb. And all we're going to do now is take the sausage and lay that in the middle. They're flavoured with harissa, a fiery chilli paste which gives them their heat and distinctive colour. It really does give that nice sort of wake-up call inside the stuffing. If you can't get hold of mergays, other spicy sausages like shrizo would work well too. Take the rest of the stuffing and we'll sit that on top so it encases that mergays. Once you've got it like that, lift up the tinfoil very carefully, and roll that over. Let the tin do the work, roll it nice and tight. There. Fingers underneath. Just pull that back and double check. Lovely. Look at it, it's not even cooked yet and it looks delicious. 
the ultimate Christmas cracker. Fantastic. That sage will cook and really perfume the sausage meat. And you cut through to the center, you've got that nice spicy sausage. Lovely. In. Now, roll it across, twist at the ends, and then from there, up into the hands, and you push it in and twist and turn. And all that's doing is just making the perfect cylinder. Beautiful. The stuffing can be made, wrapped and stored in the fridge a day or two in advance. That's the first part of my ultimate Christmas dinner ready. On Christmas Day, simply pop it into the oven and cook at 200 degrees for 40 minutes. Coming up next on my ultimate Christmas menu, the secret of bringing your turkey to life with my caramelized cranberry and apple sauce. Salt and pepper really helps to balance that tartness against the acidity of the apple. It really just helps to sort of wake up the flavor of a turkey. Tips for getting the children involved, making the perfect mint chocolate truffles. So I'll have one for the adults in cocoa powder and one with flakes. Wait, put your hands down. Put your hands down. And how to cook the ultimate roast turkey. When I first got the chance to cook Christmas lunch for the chefs in Paris, they taught me one crucial thing. What a difference. Sauces are one of the important ways chefs add extra dimension and flavor to dishes. You can use this trick at home. My caramelized cranberry and apple sauce is another recipe I always cook a day in advance. It packs a wonderful punch that really lifts the subtle flavor of the turkey. It's simple to make, and with its deep red vibrant color, looks fantastic on the plate. The secret behind any good Christmas is in the organization and the preparation. Anything you can get done in advance, do it. Apple and cranberry sauce is a prime example. First things first, we're gonna make a really nice caramel. Sugar in. Add 150 grams of caster sugar to a pan, followed by a couple of star anise. That helps to really give a nice sort of aniseed flavor to the cranberries. Next, lightly crush four cardamom pods. This adds a lovely warm, spicy, sweet flavor. Then wait for the sugar to melt and form a caramel. Really important to have the confidence now to color that caramel so it gets really nice and dark before putting the cranberries in. Wow. The smell of that caramel is amazing. Now, cranberries in. Cranberries are very tart and acidic, but balanced with the sweetness of the caramel and apples, they give the sauce a lovely dry, sharp note. To tell if they're fresh, drop them on a hard service. The higher they bounce, the fresher they are. The secret now is for the caramel to blister the cranberries and really start to break that down. It smells fantastic. Next, core, peel, and thinly slice two apples. And once the sauce is finished, it really does help to sort of wake up the flavor of the turkey. Now the cranberries are starting to break down. Apple in. Smells fantastic. A touch of salt and pepper. That's really important. Really helps to balance that tartness against the acidity of the apple. Salt and pepper really brings it back. The smell is fantastic. It's like a sort of sweet, sour, spicy, nice. Now from there, delays the pan with a touch of port. Round the side. Deglazing dissolves all the lovely sticky caramelized bits of food that are stuck to the pan and incorporates them into the sauce. Next, add the zest of an orange. And for another layer of fragrant sweetness, squeeze in the juice. Lovely. Then cook on a low heat for five to 10 minutes to thicken. But remember, the sauce will become even thicker once it's cooled down. Now, that is the right texture. I don't want a runny sauce. I want something really nice and thick, delicious, packed full of flavor. Perfect. If you really want to get ahead, this sauce can be made three or four days in advance and kept in the fridge, which allows the flavors to develop even more. Mm. Then on Christmas Day, simply bring it up to room temperature and serve. Another job done, leaving you more time to enjoy this very special day.
another golden rule at Christmas is, don't do all the work yourself, delegate. At home, I'm raising my own little brigade of sous chefs who are always willing to help with any recipe that involves chocolate and the possibility of licking the mixing spoon. Another thing I always do the day before Christmas is knock up a batch of mint chocolate truffles. They're child's play to make and have a wonderful fresh mint flavour. The perfect after dinner chocolates. Right, Megan, Jack, I need some help. Yes. Yeah? Chocolate, mint, truffles. First things first, yeah? What we should do is get this block of dark chocolate and just break it up into small pieces. Okay, Meg, that's for you. Jack, that's for you. Mate, where do you get that tie from? Not a tie. <laughs> very, very smart. Right. Mint chocolate truffles. The secret here mm. is getting that mint mm. flavour mint. into the chocolate. So look, best thing to do, get a little bunch of mint and just lightly bruise it. You can flavour the truffles with whatever takes your fancy. From fresh chilli, which gives it a surprisingly delicious kick, to orange zest, to a splash of brandy. Right, double cream and single cream in. The cream makes the truffles wonderfully soft, luscious and rich. Mm, nice. Next, add a generous pour of honey, which helps to sweeten the dark chocolate. Now, bring that out to the boil. Now, the secret is we pour that on top of the chocolate. Okay, so we've literally got two minutes to get this done quick. That's why I need some help. In half. Dad? Yes? Can you beat this up with a rolling pin? That's a very good or, idea. Or would it be too small? No, it's a very good idea. Because what we can't afford to do is for the cream to reduce. If the cream reduces, then the consistency of the truffle becomes too hard. But it's a very good idea, Jack. You know that. Now, gently with that. I've got your boyfriend a present. No. Oh, yeah, just ask him. All right, just ask him. What's I he buying? I actually bought them a... Um... Them? <laughs> what? Your big sister's got more than one boyfriend. I haven't yeah. got one. Jack's got... Ooh. Go Jack's on. Jack's got a girlfriend. Jack, what's her name? Emma. Emma. What have you bought Emma for Christmas? Don't tell Seriously, me. Seriously, Dad? Yeah, a table of two at Daddy's restaurant. Next, add 130 grams of softened butter to give the truffles a glorious richness and sheen. Break it up into small little bits. Yeah? Nice. Good. Once the cream and milk have come to the boil... Yeah? I can really smell the mint. Strain over the broken chocolate. Oh, that oh. smells delicious. Push that mint flavour through there. So yeah, it really does come out. Juice. Yeah, so it really does come out. Give that a nice stir. Oh, look, I can see the chocolate oh. at the bottom. Okay. Look. See how the chocolate's dissolving? And that honey has given it a really nice glaze. Sweetness, Sweetness as well, because it's bitter chocolate, that's right. Dark chocolate. And then the butter Whoa. starts to give the chocolate a really nice shine. So then what will actually happen it happen Jack. to Matt <laughs> Do That, look at that. Oh. Beautiful. Right, that. Do you want to lick the spoon? Just put your tongue out. <laughs> 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 no, right. <laughs> then pour the chocolate into a container and chill in the fridge for about an hour to firm up. Jack, I don't want any fingers in there. Top shelf. <laughs> you can see. Let it go nice and firm. As the truffle mixture sets, prepare the coating. So I'll have one. For the adults in cocoa powder, yeah? And one with flakes. Yeah, no, surprise, surprise. So wait, put your hands down. Put your hands. put your hands down. So look, you just go like that and twist the flake onto the plate. You can coat the truffles in anything you like. Finely chopped pistachios or almonds work really well with the mint. Or to give them a bit of crunch, plain brown sugar. Once the truffle mixture has set, it's time to roll out the chocolates. Mega, dear, oh dear. Right, OK, I'm going to show you one first, yeah? So hands really nicely cold. Now, the secret is, in there. Wow, that's what? really gone hard. Manipulate it first like that, and then look. Roll, and then quickly, bang. Look, nothing on my hands. Shake off excess, it. and then just on. Beautiful. Now, in there. And uh, let's go. Come on, Jack. Oh, Dear, hello. When you're ready. <laughs> huh? It'll be New Year's Eve by the time we get one done. Just try and try and drop it on there rather than place it on there, mate. Okay. The nice thing about making them by hand 
They're not all the exact same size, yeah? Handmade chocolate mint truffles. Jack, the secret is a truffle <laughs> is a one-bite wonder, not a golf ball. I have to hurry up, because if the ganache starts melting, we're in trouble. I thought you said there wasn't going to be any chocolate on your hat. That's because you're slow. Show me your hands. Right, Jack, let me help you here. Yeah? Not so, not so big. Yeah. Round like that, like that. Yeah, and then like that, in straight in. Oh, <laughs> I I wanted to do it. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Daddy, look, one fell into the cream. Right. <laughs> Try and put yours in cocoa powder this time. Look, put it in cocoa powder. <laughs> <laughs> right, stop, 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 stop. No, no, no. <laughs> right, Jack, what I've said. Quick. Um, and whilst he's gone, let's turn these into proper little truffles, shall we? Let's cut them down. When the truffles are coated and the kids are cleaned up, decorate them with sprigs of mint. So it looks nice and... Christmassy. Yeah? Christmassy, that's right. Would you like to try one? Oh, yes, yes please. please. OK, which one should we go for, flake or cocoa? Flake. Flake. Mmm. <laughs> Thank you. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. You can really taste the mint. You can really taste the mint, can't you? Mm. Then prize the truffles away from the kids and pop in the fridge ready for Christmas Day. Another job done. On Christmas Eve, it's brilliant knowing I've already got three delicious recipes ready for Christmas dinner tomorrow. Santa and his team have got a busy night in front of them, but I'm going to bed ready for the big day ahead. job on Christmas Day morning is to tackle the turkey. And my favourite way to cook it is roasted with lemon, parsley and garlic. It's fantastically aromatic, really easy to do, keeps the meat succulent and tastes absolutely delicious. For me, without question, the star of the Christmas dinner is this, a delicious turkey. Now, once this is in the oven, you're halfway there. The secret success behind a great Christmas dinner is making sure this doesn't turn out dry and is all in the preparation. Now, we're going to make an amazing butter. And this is sort of the start of the, the most important part, keeping that bird incredibly moist. Soft butter. A touch of salt and pepper. A little touch of olive oil in there. That stops the butter from burning. Next, add the zest of two lemons and their juice. This gives the flavoured butter a wonderful citrus zing. Three cloves of garlic. Turkey's a very delicate, dainty meat, and that's why I want the garlic pureed, so it sort of disintegrates and flavours the turkey gently without becoming too overpowering. Then add a generous handful of chopped parsley. Wow, that smells incredibly light. Give that a good mix. Turkey's a very, very, very lean bird and it dries out. So it's so important to make sure that we help it to cook perfectly. Butter done. Now prepare the turkey. We're going to season the bird inside the cavity. Salt and pepper. Next, half two onions and pop them in. As they roast, they steam inside the bird, giving it a lovely sweetness. Put in the lemon and a couple of bay leaves for their bittersweet, spicy flavour. We're sort of lining the inside of the turkey with these fantastic sort of flavours. You can see the bird is upright and it's looking sort of like it's standing to attention. Now it's time to add the flavoured butter. And just very, very carefully open up the skin. Go through over the back of the breast and keep the skin intact. The idea is to gently loosen the skin with your fingers so the butter can be stuffed underneath it. Now, once you've loosened all the skin off the top of the thighs, turn the bird round and just go through here again. Hand up and just release a little bit. But don't completely break it because I don't want all that butter to run out. Right, from there. Now, take your butter, put it into a ball. That smells amazing. Lemony, 
citrusy and just sort of flatten it and stick that in there. Underneath, one side. Now, once you've got it in there, pull back the skin and just use that to sort of slide all the way down. And what we want to do now is line the top of the breast with all that butter there. That butter is going to keep the turkey breast really seriously moist. Turn the bird round and finish covering the breast with the butter. Turkeys originally came from North America and they're best young and plump. My favourite breed for Christmas is either Norfolk Black or Norfolk Bronze, both of which have a wonderful gamey taste. Take the rest of the butter and carefully massage over the breast, legs and wings. You can do all this the night before and simply cover the turkey with tinfoil and keep it in the fridge, ready to be cooked on Christmas Day. Into the tray. A little touch of olive oil. Now, olive oil on top. Again, that protects it, gets that skin really nice and crispy and it stops the butter from burning. Now, in the oven at 220 for 10 minutes to get really nice and brown. Quickly, in she goes. Beautiful. That smells fantastic. After 10 minutes, take the turkey out of the oven and baste. Then cover the breast with smoked streaky bacon. What I want to do is add a little bit more flavor. I'm already starting to think about my gravy. So the bacon protects it, stops it from drying out, but it's going to start to really give my gravy a wonderful base. Turn down the oven to 180 degrees. This five kilogram bird will feed eight people comfortably. It needs roasting for two and a half hours or half an hour per kilo, basting every so often. Back in. And now she's on the way. Look at that. Beautiful. It's as pretty as a Christmas tree. Next on the menu, the secret of making the perfect breakfast for Christmas Day. Never whip up the egg beforehand. You break down the egg too much. What I want is a really nice, rich, creamy scrambled egg. And to go with the ultimate roast turkey, the ultimate gravy made with cider and crushed walnuts. Take off all your little trimmings, all these little bits here, and that into your gravy. These are the bits we never use. And my recipe for a lovely, light steamed pudding with whiskey cream. Do you think your way is good way? Trust me. Mum, I know it's my kitchen, but there's only one way, and that is my way. Rub balls. Hey, hey, rubs. My ultimate Christmas day is a relaxed affair with great food. When you're well prepared, there's no need to rush. So once the turkey's underway, Christmas morning in the Ramsey household always starts with a late breakfast of deliciously creamy scrambled eggs and smoked salmon. This recipe is a Ramsey family tradition on Christmas day. Smoked salmon, scrambled egg and croissant. It's rich, sumptuous, and incredibly easy to do. First, the croissants. Slice them into rounds and season them lightly with salt and pepper. The secret behind a really good breakfast is in the timing. I want the croissants on first, smoked salmon on top, and then the scrambled egg. Put the croissants in a dry pan and toast. You don't need oil because the croissants have a lot of butter in them. This is a great way to transform day-old croissants, giving them a delicious new life. You just start to see them toasting almost glistening in the pan. And that's the butter inside. That smell is amazing. It almost smells like a sort of caramelized waffle. Absolutely delicious. Toast them all around, both sides, and then out. Next, just get the smoked salmon and sort of twist it and let it fall over the croissant. Let it sit naturally on top of the toasted croissant. twist and over. Right, scrambled eggs. Eggs into the pan. Never whip up the egg beforehand. You break down the egg too much. What I want is a really nice, rich, creamy scrambled egg. Eggs in. No seasoning at this stage. A nice, generous knob of butter. Now, from there, onto the heat. And all we're going to do now is stir. 
stir and stir and stir. Now the butter's melting and it's given a really nice creamy texture to the eggs. It looks rich, delicious, sumptuous, luxurious. If you're very careful making a scrambled egg, all of a sudden it looks runny and within 30 seconds it's cooked, working it all the time. Right, after stirring, a plastic scraper in there. Take the pan off the heat and just work round the pan, cleaning up all that scrambled egg that's sticking to the bottom. And now look, we're getting that really nice sort of creamy, beautiful texture. A little touch of butter in there. Now, I'm gonna start with the seasoning. 30 seconds from the end, salt, pepper. Back on to the stove and a tablespoon of cream. The cream actually stops the scrambled egg from overcooking. Cream in and then fold that in there. Now, keep that off the heat. But look at it, look at that color. Beautiful. And then finally, some fresh chives. is a Ramsey classic. Smoked salmon, toasted croissant, and a delicious scrambled egg. The best start to Christmas Day anyone could wish for. Let's go, guys. With breakfast inside us, the turkey happily cooked in the oven, the stuffing, the mint chocolate truffles, and the cranberry and apple sauce done the day before, I've got time to go for a walk with the kids to build up a proper appetite. <laughs> Hey, hey. <laughs> That's into the swing. Swings. Wait, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> Come on, Come on. Come on. <laughs> right. Are you ready for Christmas lunch? Yeah. Right. That smells fantastic. Wow. Look at that. Beautiful. That is 90% of your work done there. To test the turkey is cooked, stick a knife into the bottom of the thigh and if the juices run clear, it's done. The secret now is to let the turkey rest uncovered for two and a half hours. As the meat relaxes, it reabsorbs its juices, making it succulent and tender, plus it'll be easier to carve. It might seem like a long time to let it rest, but remember, the turkey doesn't need to be piping hot because I'm serving it with hot gravy. That looks like a million dollars. Let that rest because the flavor will be 10 times more exciting once it's rested. The key to pulling all the different elements of your Christmas dinner together on the plate is the gravy. My recipe for turkey gravy, made with cider and walnuts, has a wonderful apple nutty flavour which beautifully complements the turkey meat and fruity pork stuffing. As that turkey's resting, I want to make the most amazing gravy. And when I say amazing, I really do mean amazing. Drain the excess fat from the roasting tray and put it back on the heat. Then remove the bacon from the top of the turkey and the roasted onions from the cavity. Look at them. My God, they smell amazing. Finally, take out the roasted lemon. First of all, cut up the bacon. Lovely. Bacon into the tray. 
Hear how crispy that is. That's the start of our gravy. The onion, look at it. Beautiful. Doesn't get any better than that. Chop that up. Onion and bacon in. That smells incredible. When I first got the chance to cook Christmas lunch for the chefs in Paris, they taught me one crucial thing. I was only 21 at the time, and they made me rest the turkey for as long as I cooked it. So I cooked it for three hours, and I rested it for three hours. What a difference. Incredible. Next, chop up the roasted lemon and add to the tray. Put in a couple of sprigs of rosemary to give it a lovely aromatic punch and fry. Then, add three chopped tomatoes, which helps to thicken the gravy and give it a lovely fresh taste. Now it's time to really get the turkey flavor into the gravy. Snap off the wing. Take off all your little trimmings, all these little bits here. Add that into your gravy. These are the bits we never use. Everyone throws them away. Off there, that little baby there. Take him off. I want that. Bang. Flavor, delicious. Fry that off. The smell is incredible. Next, pour in the dry cider. This adds a lovely subtle apple flavor that really lifts the taste of the turkey meat. As the cider starts to reduce, pour in the delicious resting juices from the roasted turkey. Wow, there you go. The most amazing flavor. When the liquid has reduced by half, crush the vegetables and the turkey pieces with a masher to extract the maximum amount of flavor. And basically what's happening now is that we're giving the gravy a little bit of body. Pour in the chicken stock and reduce again. In. Now, a little taste. Mm. Wow. And you just close your eyes and it, wow, it oozes flavor and turkey. Now sieve it. Use the back of the ladle to push it through the sieve extracting every last drop of flavor. Pop in a sprig of rosemary and leave to infuse, ready for the finishing touch. Simply add crushed walnuts to the bottom of the gravy boat and ladle in the hot gravy. Every year when I was growing up, my mum made a traditional Christmas pudding. Now I'm getting her back in the kitchen to help me cook my updated version. A modern, light steam pudding with whiskey cream. It's super simple to make and deliciously delicate to eat. And it can be flambéed at the table so you don't miss out on all that drama. All right, mum, welcome to a proper kitchen. Now, today we're not going to burn anything. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make a really nice, fragrant, steamed, yeah, Sponge pudding. Why are you looking at Christmas? Like that? Sponge pudding. Why? Well, well, we never get to eat Christmas pudding because it's always a little too full. So I want to make something a little bit lighter. Ladies. People like to stick to tradition in Christmas, yeah. can't would they? You, would you mind if I just try something a little bit different? Yeah, well, then go. Let's have a yeah. go at it. First, Mum grates the zest of an orange into a lightly buttered pudding basin, whilst I get on with a sponge mix. Add 210 grams of butter and 210 grams of light brown sugar to the mixer and beat. Do you think your way is good way? Trust me. Mum, I know it's my kitchen, but there's only one way, and that is my way. Oh, don't be cheeky now. <laughs> is that enough, Chef? Um, you just use all the orange. I don't like waste. So sorry. That was you who taught me that. Then pour a few tablespoons of maple syrup into the pudding basin and put in three bay leaves. Bay leaves are an extraordinary versatile herb. Bay leaves in a pudding? I've never had that. Really? Their bittersweet, spicy taste works brilliantly in everything from meat stews, marinades and fish dishes to sweet custards and rice puddings. To finish the sponge mix, beat together four eggs and slowly add to the cream butter and sugar. Slower, slower. And again, please, nice and slow. Slowly. There you go. Right, now, flour and baking powder. Sieve in 100 grams of self-raising flour and three teaspoons of baking powder. Then add a teaspoon of ground cloves. It gives that really nice sort of aniseedy richness to it. There you are. Okay, thank you. Can you look at the measurement? So, 
<laughs> Get that nice. Right, a little pinch of salt. And I'm just going to give that a nice little mix. Fold that flour in. That's Why don't you use the whisk when you're doing that? Because I want to knock all that air out there. Now, into the bowl. OK. Steaming the pudding in a sealed container means it cooks slowly and keeps in all the moisture, making the sponge lovely and light. Lovely. Nice. To cover the pudding with a circle of baking parchment, take a square sheet and fold. Yeah, over halfway. That's it. See? Now, that's yeah. going to fit lovely. And a little bit of butter. Butter one side so it doesn't stick when the pudding cooks. Double that up. And tie it tightly over the basin. Can you put your finger on there, please, mate? Lovely. Tin pot. Shiny side out. And twist. At the end. Once the pudding's sealed, place a ramekin in the pan. This keeps the basin off the bottom so it can steam evenly. I should water. put a wee saucer in the bottom of it. A little saucer. A saucer. Really? Pour yeah. in hot yeah. water. Pop nice. in the pudding and steam for one and a half hours. Topping it up with hot water if it boils dry. To go with the steam pudding, we're making a super simple whiskey cream. Start right. by whisking 150 millilitres of double cream. And, and whisk. Lovely. I always get the hard jobs, Gordy. I'm just thinking of those bingo wings, Mum. That's <laughs> all, I mean, bingo hands. You're going to get a smack in a minute. <laughs> right. Eyes down, yes. Okay, yeah. Look in. There you are. Right, thank you. Now, a little splash of whisky. A little drop. Yeah, just a little drop. OK. Lovely. And then finally, a little bit of Irish cream. Mm, now you're talking. Now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, well, it smells delicious. Doesn't it? We'll stop there, Mum, just in case we have butter in 30 seconds' time. Thank you. <laughs> it's a nightmare having you in the kitchen. <laughs> OK. Mm. That was lovely. Put the whiskey cream in the fridge until you're ready to serve. Now, that should be ready. I'm hoping, of course. When the pudding has finished steaming, it turn it out onto a plate. Does the trick. Wow, look at that. That looks stuffy. Doesn't it? Just loosen it a little bit on the sides. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Fingers crossed. This pudding is another dish you can make in advance. Simply reheat by steaming again. Oops, Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, do you mind? <laughs> On you go, Gordon. It's your show. Yeah, I know. Nice, 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 nice. Look at the top, it's lovely, isn't it? With the Baileys, yeah. that. Mm, smells amazing. To fill the pudding, heat some whiskey, light at the table, and pour over. Coming up, how to give your roast potatoes a delicious kick. Chili? Yeah, chili flake. Just put a little bit of heat in there. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and the secret to making Brussels sprouts taste extraordinary. So we've managed to turn a sort of plain Jane sprout into something delicious. About an hour before you're ready to serve Christmas dinner, it's time to cook the final dishes and make the finishing touches. First, I'm getting Mum to help cook my chilli and turmeric roasted potatoes. This dish is another twist on tradition. It gives the potatoes a lovely colour and their spicy kick helps complement and lift the whole Christmas meal. We're just going to do, again, a little twist to the potatoes. We do need some goose fat, are we? Uh, no, no. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Goose fat. And we're going to do a really nice, um, lightly spiced roast potato, OK? A little chilli flake. Chilli? Yeah, chilli flake. Just to put a little bit of heat in there. For the Christmas lunch? Yep, chilli flake and a little bit of turmeric. I can't believe you're doing roast potatoes with chilli. <laughs> now, would you be so kind just to give them a little cut? Cut the peeled potatoes into quarters and put into salted cold water. In they go. OK. Bring them up to the boil and simmer for around eight minutes. Drain and let them steam. Then season with salt and pepper. On there. And just a little teaspoon of chilli flake. Oh. No? That's the sort of thing I would make for supper on a Saturday night or something like that, you know? Really? Chilli flakes in. 
add a teaspoon of turmeric. Turmeric is a member of the ginger family. It stains the potatoes a wonderful golden color and adds a lovely earthy taste. Next, drizzle in a little olive oil and shake to coat them. Just let them roll around. Yeah. That smells nice. Beautiful. And could you get me the uh, stuffing, please, from the fridge? Put in a preheated baking tray with extra olive oil and cook at 200 degrees Celsius for about 40 minutes. Give them a little shake to make sure they don't stick. And then I'll just stick the stuffing. Thank you, Mum. On top, yeah? Now, that will take roughly about the same time as the potatoes. Stuffing in, potatoes done. Nice. Why are you going to play with the kids? I will do, yeah. Okay. See you shortly. Thank you. Bye-bye. Christmas dinner wouldn't be complete without Brussels sprouts. But when I was a child, they were boiled until horribly soft. I want to keep my sprouts crisp, vibrant and fresh. Sautéed with pancetta and chestnuts, these are sprouts like you've never tasted before. And Brussels sprouts are delicious when they're cooked perfectly, packed with texture. And the flavour is extraordinary. Take off the outer leaves, trim the bottom and cut in half. That's a big step up from the crisscross on the bottom that my mother used to do every Christmas. I'm cutting them in half, so when I sauté them, they cook evenly. And look, it's like little baby cabbages. It's so compact. Then blanch them in salted boiling water for two minutes. Now, this is the most amazing pancetta, lightly cured. Pancetta is a type of Italian bacon, which is brilliant for adding a lovely, rich, meaty flavor to dishes. I want a really nice, robust flavor to go with that earthy texture of the sprout. It's made from pork belly and is dry cured with salt and aromatics like juniper, bay leaves, nutmeg, dry thyme and garlic. As it hits the pan, that fat on top of the pancetta melts and gives the sprouts this amazing flavor. After removing the skin, cut into small chunks. If you can't get hold of pancetta, smoked streaky bacon is a good alternative. Now, hot pan, a teaspoon of olive oil. Give it a light seasoning with salt and pepper. As the lardons start to crisp up, take your sprouts out, drain them, Sprouts in. Now give that a really nice little toss. Then chop up a handful of chestnuts. Now the chestnuts sweeten the flavor of the sprout. Really important that you don't put the chestnuts in too early, otherwise they'll go mush. And then just sprinkle the chestnuts over. Lovely. So we've managed to turn a sort of plain Jane sprout into something quite delicious. You've got the texture of the smoked bacon, the sautéed sprout, and that nice crunch and sweetness of the festive chestnut. Ten seconds before they come out, lemon zest. Over. Now that makes the sprouts and the bacon harmonize. And then just a squeeze of fresh lemon juice over the sprouts. Beautiful. This right now is the ultimate. And for me, that's a really nice, modern, 21st century approach to cooking an old-fashioned vegetable. With the sprouts done, I'm ready to serve my ultimate Christmas dinner. The turkey's cooked and rested. Right. Take the turmeric and chili roasted potatoes from the oven. Now they look and smell fantastic. Look at that. Beautiful. Yay! Happy Christmas! Yay! Slice the pork, apricot, and pistachio stuffing. <laughs> As the gravy reheats, crush the walnuts. It's a really nice combination. Crushed walnuts with a turkey gravy. 
sprinkle in the gravy boat, and it's ready to serve. Stuffing, gravy, and cranberry. Here's the turkey. Yay! Right, who likes the breast? Yeah. That turkey is amazing. Wait one minute, Dad. It smells so nice. <laughs> Congratulations on your tire trapeze fall. Amazing. Congratulations, Jack. You have now one Michelin tire. Yeah, man. <laughs> Happy Christmas. And how are the potatoes? I've got to say they're really nice and really? lovely. Merry Christmas.